talked strength training for fat loss last week. I wanted to get into specific nutrition protocols for fat loss. So can you give us like the general overview and then we'll just keep diving in? Yeah. So we're, we're hopefully building some sort of masterclass here on fat loss. This general overall view of, hey, we want to be in a deficit and then come from energy expenditure or decrease energy intake. Now we want to kind of gamify this. How do we get to eat less, so to speak? So last week we talked about how do we expend more? Now we want to kind of talk about how do we take in less energy? And, you know, this is where that psychological aspect is like comes into play. The, the dynamic, as we talked about in overall weight loss, our first podcast episode three in the season was, Hey, this is going to be a lot more psychological then it actually will be physiological. And probably the bigger thing to adjust here is energy intake. And this is the common thread I see in exercise. It's outworking a bad diet type of mindset, right? People are like, hey, I don't want to change anything outside of the one hour that I'm exercising four to five times a week. You know, that's, you're going to be responsible for overcoming my bad lifestyle and habit and unwillingness to change diet and nutrition. Where if you just, look at the pie chart distribution, it's five hours and then how many hours in a week, right? 24 hours in a day times seven, you know, so it's, it's pretty dominated by what we're not doing in the gym as changing the actual body composition and specifically weight loss and hopefully fat loss. And I think that's the part that as we break down, you're going to have to have a lot more responsibility as a athlete or client for this than then you maybe possibly understand or appreciate, right? I go see an expert like myself or you, and you say, hey, I wanna lose weight. And you tell us all the things that you wanna accomplish. And then you say, craft this perfect program. And then it gets to the, okay, well, majority of this is gonna fall on you to eat better and make sure that you are changing your lifestyle and habits. And then it gets to, well, what am I paying you for, right? And that that's a, that's a really difficult thing to answer as a coach or a practitioner. Like, well, you're paying me for the outcome, really, right? We're, we're, we're getting you to that destination in the most linear, efficient path possible, right? And trying to have as little collateral damage as possible from an injury or breaking you physiologically or metabolically or anything else. But the dynamic that plays itself out over and over and over is the coaches that are really good at getting people to lose weight and lose body fat are the ones that understand that majority of this is gonna fall on that client or athlete and figuring out what is their willingness to change, right? So just a classic readiness to change model. So going from the pre-contemplation to you're already in a habit loop, there's more modern updated versions of this from the hooked model of like the same kind of trajectory, but just trying to create these like repetitive loops that create a reward kind of feedback this dynamic as we start to play itself out as a coach or practitioner evolves from what we know to do in a weight room and what we know to do from a, a starting point from nutrition, right? We, I know how to get you in a deficit caloric wise. I know what macronutrients to focus on. I know how to time those macronutrients. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy logic. We're looking at endocrine system and the feedback loop created off of that from eating certain foods like carbohydrates versus fats, eating at a certain times, you know, whether it's late, late in the day, early in the day, post-workout, pre-workout. I know all that stuff. But that's not going to be the limiting factor here. The limiting factor, quite frankly, will be what that person's compliance and consistency is over time. And that just falls into a whole spectrum of motivation, psychology, looking at their overall setup for success, right? They're, the groups are associated with their disposable income to buy more congruent foods with their diet, maybe throwing away foods that are not congruent, right? The association of... Well, I paid money for that, so I don't want to be wasteful, but that kind of creates this like other second order feedback loop of like, well, it's in the pantry already, so I have to replenish that. And, you know, there's a lot of variables to go into this, but high level, you know, the, the central theme is, is my job is to figure out how do I get you in a deficit through taking in less energy than you would need to maintain your body weight. And a lot of that is going to be centered around 
the psychological aspect. And I, I think there's ways that we kind of organically learn, okay, this is a way to adjust someone's caloric intake without them really even knowing it. But that's a start point, right? The, we need to be in a deficit somehow, some way. And the good coaches will figure out how to interpret that person's motivation, willingness to change, their already compliance or understanding about nutrition and physiology. And then from there, just going to work and holding them accountable and keeping them consistent and compliant over a longer period of time. So I feel like we've hammered the psychological aspect and that consistency aspect, putting the onus back on the client quite a bit. One thing I wanted to get back to is you mentioned breaking someone metabolically. We want to prevent that. That's our job as coaches. And I guess my question would be for the, for the listeners out there is maybe they didn't know you could be broken metabolically. So what does like a broken metabolism, so to speak, look like? And then how can we make sure we're preventing that? Because we do want to be in a deficit, but you could go too far, right? So how do we make sure we're not doing that? Yeah. So there is starvation research, right? We know from research out there that being in extreme deficits for a extended period of time can metabolically damage people, right? They start to get a inverted relationship with their metabolism from having less energy, right? Their body is now trying to fight to preserve tissue. And that goes from protecting organs, that goes from protecting the muscular system, that goes from protecting the the skeletal system, right? These things are foundational for human human function, right? That if we don't have our organ, organs working properly, if we don't have our muscles working properly, if we don't have our skeletal system keeping us upright, that eventually will lead into a compromised state. And then I'll be susceptible to immunocompromised. I'll be susceptible to not being able to do other things like live and function. We know eating disorders are usually where this comes out the most in modern history. You know, people with bulimia, people with anorexia, people with body dysmorphia, you know, there's a dynamic there. And one of the other elements that is coming out with athletes, so on the female side, there's a female athlete triad leading into caloric deficit, over energy expenditure, body issues, leading into things like loss of menstrual cycle and other other functions that will help them recover from workouts. Same thing with males of uh, this, it's termed differently, but it's red, it's relative energy deficit. And when we look at the dynamic of, hey, I'm gonna exercise too much and that's gonna lead into, well, it's just easier if I don't eat because, you know, hey, I might have to work out again, or, hey, I can lose weight more quickly if I'm just over-exercising and being a little bit, a little bit obsessive about it. And I think there's like a whole other image of social media and everything, so of like, what is the perfect female or male aesthetic and this feeling of always being on display and looking at certain things that are portrayed as, you know, healthy, you know, from really lean body compositions for under 5% for male year round or under 10% for females year round. But what that's going to have is an issue for endocrine function or your hormones and your organs. That's going to have an issue for, you're going to lose bone mineral density. Like you're going to actually deplete muscle and you're going to go through this process of finding energy from tissues that are foundational for life and support and your function, your ability. And then all of a sudden you start getting sick a lot and you start to get maybe a lower quality of life from just being super conscious, overly conscious to a point where it's counterproductive on energy intake and relative to energy expenditure. You know, there's a, there's a dynamic at play that as practitioners and coaches, it's trying to figure out a way to get someone from a, maybe a surplus of energy and obesity and metabolic derangement in that direction over to the other end of, hey, we just need to get this person in a deficit. We need to get them more conscious of what they're eating, helping them chip away at this big, big pandemic of, or epidemic, I guess in this case would be, you know, obesity and lifestyle related diseases like metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease on the other end, not letting it get too violently swung the other way of getting people a bunch of disorders of, of just being in a, a deficit for too long and exercising too much. So that dynamic is important. And it's like the hypernatremia conversation of, oh man, don't let people drink too much water. Like, these are extreme cases. Like you got to drink a lot of water in a very short period of time to get hypernatremia. Like, and it's legitimate. It's real. It's usually in endurance athletes of marathoners or ultra marathoners 
or triathletes who are trying to water load because they don't know if they're going to get enough fluids during the race the next day and they get into this but it's breaking like 10 liters per per pound of body weight like type of dynamic right just flooding their body with fluid right and i'm exaggerating for exaggerating point but the chances of someone over hydrating in a normal everyday world is very small and minuscule but i don't know if that necessarily is the same conversation about someone developing an eating disorder or body dysmorphia because if we push them too hard and we get them too focused on this like they become an unhealthy relationship with food and they look at food as not energy or a relationship component or a social component or just things that are you know just generally rewarding like why we have a long tradition of using food as a way to congregate and connect to others and we deprive people of that when we say we're going to lose body mass or we're going to lose body we're going to improve your body comp because it's socially more challenging to do that and that process is like all right we got to look start to pick our battles and play the long game here and have a healthy relationship with food and understand that it's all about this balance with hey, i am moving closer to my goal and i'm not trying to get it done by tomorrow but you know, every week, every month, every year, I'm making more positive decisions for my health. Yeah, I think that's a really important idea that I think a lot of times people have a hard time understanding. It's like, okay, I've been the way that I am for, let's say, 32 years in my case. If I want to make a change that counters those previous 32 years, it's not going to happen in a week or a month. It may take another couple of years to get where I want to go, and we got to focus on playing the long game. So, and with it in mind, keeping, we don't want to go too far and disrupt our metabolism, you know, insulin resistance, all that stuff. And we don't want to break it down too far and get into reds. What protocols are you typically using to make sure we're in that sweet spot? First, it's addition by subtraction. Get people drinking more water. Get people sleeping more. Get people eating more fibrous rich foods. Get people eating more protein rich foods, right? So starting at the top, more water. And, that, and that's just fluid, right? And then getting them more in control of their fluid intake. Because a lot of times there's, there's associations with certain meals with high calorie based drinks, right? So the, hey, have a pizza and a Coke or I have a, have a beer and, and a hot dog. That kind of stuff is, is very commonplace and they're associated and, and people market that and the, the flavor profiles. And I think something too of, this is a very big much in, much in Eastern philosophy, but there is a overconsumption of certain flavors and there is a the spectrum of sweet, salty, savory, and then there's sour, bitter. A lot of times we look at the complementary of some of these foods is just getting all these different flavor profiles together and it makes a much more balanced flavor. But with that being said is we can kind of get too locked in on those flavors. And, you know, when we look at Eastern medicine, They'll look at people who overconsume sugar will get obese, and that leads into a whole different yang yin profile. But we can just use this intuitively. Like, look at the inventory of what you eat all day, and a lot of times it's going to be very sweet, very savory, because that's usually higher energy. And as a person or species designed to find high energy foods, because we're more of a, a history of food not being omnipresent and going periods of 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 extreme fasting without any food resources available to us when we find high energy feel, foods we usually overconsume them but with that being said is water and in replace of things like soda and sugary drinks that's a pretty good place to start so hey should i have a a sports drink avoid it you know just drink water well, what, how am I going to get my electrolytes? Well, put some Himalayan sea salt on your foods. That's it. How am I supposed to get like my potassium? Have a banana. Like this, like other element of, hey, let's get some foods that have some fiber in there, have some other micronutrients in there, as opposed to just concentrated doses of sugar, salt, and p potassium. Eliminating things that f fill up stuff like coffee. So just calories, right? Calories and sugar. So if I look at it from, hey, I usually get a black coffee, uh, that's, intentional because hey one less thing i have to count for calories and that's the next trick here i'll go through it in a second but when you start counting calories and you start going through stuff man like it becomes more of a burden to take in cream and sugar because you have to calculate that and like oh okay easy solution just drink black coffee and and just straight green tea but those like simple tricks that's usually the first place to start so fluid start there right water green tea black coffee 
It's got zero calories, probably pretty safe. You can get into the aspartame stuff and like diet drinks and stuff like that. But for the short term, just drink water, green tea, and, and black coffee. Two little things right there. You get a sour and a bitter. Pretty good. Then we go into high fiber foods, fruits and vegetables, things like grains and starchy tubers, depending on your gluten sensitivity. Like all that stuff is going to be beneficial, right? And the thing about fiber, Obviously helps with digestion, helps with the small and large intestine function. But the other part is it's a pretty actually low, low impact on caloric intake. It's got a high digestive process, right? So the process of breaking down fibers more than simple sugars. And then the other part is it's not going to break down the simple sugars as quickly, right? So we have a, what we call a lower glycemic index and which is going to be less of an insulinic load. So that's positive. Plus two, if you look at a lot of the, the fruits and vegetables component, it's a high fiber, high water to low calorie density. So it's got a huge weight, but actually low amount of calories. So again, here's another kind of trick of we're adding in food size and density, or I'm sorry, food weight, not necessarily density, but the caloric amount for that is lessened, right? So we're drinking more fluid with less calories. We're eating more food in terms of size, right? Eating a huge salad or eating a bunch of fruits and vegetables throughout the day, more fiber and actually less calories per actual weight. So you're fuller. So it's another kind of trick there. And then we look at things like higher protein, which has again, a higher thermic effect to feeding. So it takes a little hard, it's harder to digest and break down, but we keep this amino acid pool topped off. And a lot of times when we feel hungry, it's because one, we usually chew our foods too quickly and we just get it down. And so we're not releasing ghrelin the, the way we are. Ghrelins kind of keep getting released and leptin's not activating. So we don't feel full and we constantly feel like we need to eat more, even if it's regardless of a high energy yield from the foods that we're eating. We don't really get that trigger. So we look at those big three. And then the final one is sleeping more, which is the, the easiest and most, most convenient form of fasting, in my opinion that you're probably not waking up in the middle of the night unless you're a advanced bodybuilder and getting a protein shake at 2 a.m. You're probably not waking up. Like, so if you're gonna sit there and say, hey, look, should I include fasting into my lifestyle? Like, pretty good fasting period is from 10 to 6 a.m., 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. You know, there's an eight hour fast every day, regardless. Well, should I eat something before? You know, sometimes you don't have to eat something before you go to bed. So maybe we can stretch out that fasting period from maybe 6 or 10 p.m. to 8 p.m. or even earlier 6 p.m. So now we can go 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Or should I eat breakfast? Well, you know, maybe we need to get some fluids in first and maybe we need to get some movement and see how we feel so we can stretch out that window to 8 a.m. So now we might go from, let's just say, 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. just without eating any food. You've got a 14-hour fast right there. And you're getting a huge benefit from sleep, from your whole night cycle type of endocrine cycle of melatonin, leptin, testosterone, growth hormone, which is all going to be beneficial to your metabolism. All of a sudden thyroid and adrenals work better, right? We look at adrenal production improves in the morning and decreases at night, all sorts of great stuff. But that process of, okay, well, we're going to drink more fluids with less calories. We're going to eat foods with higher fiber, which has a high, it was a lower amount of calorie to weight type of ratio. We're going to eat more protein rich foods to keep our amino acid pool topped off to help preserve muscle mass, but also have to work harder to break that down. And then we're going to sleep more. Those big four right there is a huge addition to most people's lifestyle. And I would argue pretty much 10 out of 10 people aren't drinking enough water, are not eating enough fiber, are not eating enough protein, and aren't sleeping enough. Like, it's pretty simple, right there. Start right there, you're gonna make a huge inroad there. And the part that I would love about all that is one, everyone's gonna probably agree with it. So if you're listening to this and you're super advanced, the 99th percentile, like you're locked in, like this is beneath me, this is elementary. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the other people, everyone else in the world, myself included. Yep. That we all need to fight to get more sleep, drink more water, eat more fiber, eat more protein, right? So if it's so simple and so agreed upon, pretty good place to start. You know, this common thing, it's like a principle of nutrition is what I would call it. Of like, no one's going to argue it's going to be universally true unless they have some sort of colon issue. But chances are probably we can eat more fiber and we can eat more protein and get into kidney stuff or looking at just the overall process of breaking down proteins. But besides all of that, 
you know, the bottom line really first and foremost is let's see if we can add really net beneficial things that are not going to be argued with and then go from there. That would be the easiest place to start, right? Then from that big four, the foundational four of fat loss or weight loss in general, we move into, hey, what are going to be the psychological blocks? What do you feel like you slip up the most? Thursday night, I got to pick the kids up. I got to take them swimming and we just make bad decisions nutrition wise. Okay, can we bring food with us when we pick up our kids, whether it's just some cut up vegetables, maybe it's protein shake, maybe it's jerky. Can we do something of that nature, right? That we have a break in case of emergency type of moment. You know, that's the tricks that we get into as we start talking about fat loss and weight loss. It's have some hard boiled eggs always on re always ready to go. Have some jerky always ready to go. Have foods when you're faced with that dilemma that you're probably gonna make a bad impulse decision. Because one thing you always find is carbs will always be available, right? That no matter where you go, in any part of the country, you can find carbs like that. Because they're cheap, they're easy, and they're always gonna be liked. So that part is, don't worry about finding carbs. Worry about finding protein and vegetables. And you should build your life around, okay, worst case scenario, do I have accessibility to protein and vegetables? If I travel, if I'm driving, if I'm picking up the kids, dropping off the kids, do I have protein and vegetables available to me? Yes or no. And if not, okay, well, you need to prepare and plan around that. And there's the other part where there's a little bit more effort associated with procuring that because there's a lower shelf life, unless you're getting jerky or you're getting now they have dried, dried vegetables that are pretty decent. But you look at it from the concept of most of the stuff that we incur in terms of our daily life in getting this lifestyle is congruent with weight loss or fat loss is about handling these moments that we're probably poorly prepared for, right? The, the old adage that, you know, that there's no such thing as luck. It's just when preparation and opportunity converge. And if you want to lose weight, it's not luck that wins it. It's being prepared. And then that moment where you're going to be most challenged, you have the most things at your disposal to help you stay congruent with that goal. And then here's the other part. If you're locked in, all week and you want to have a meal that you enjoy with your friends or family you feel empowered to do it and the part that's planned and is structured right it's not a cheat meal it's a necessary amendment to a lifestyle and a diet that you know is congruent with what you want to accomplish and then maybe you get a whole thing about I mean, we can go all the way back to Mauro pasquale's anabolic diet which essentially is the first carb restricted protocol that was designed to help build muscle and we're depleting glycogen throughout the week for the in intent that we are going to create glycogen supercompensation, right? The, the whole thing of carb carbohydrate loading the night before an event, it's probably going to be more because basically we just drain the sponge of fluid from that glycogen from depleting carbs and glucose all week. And now we're going to overload and then we expand the size of that glycogen and then hopefully that muscle and we stimulate more mTOR pathways which is enzymatic property to create muscle but the other end of it is that is a very intentional psychological trick of you have rewarded yourself with a meal that you know is not necessarily 100 percent in line with your goals but it keeps you going and it keeps you locked in for a greater good the, the question though is when you react to that versus you plan it then starts getting into the reaction leads to a, a cascade effect of basically falling off the entire plan altogether versus I'm working hard all week at the Friday, I'm going to have that meal or Saturday, I have a breakfast with my family or whatever it is that's for you. And then you start to structure your lifestyle around that. And what's better about that is eventually that plan is going to migrate into now having really high energy yielding foods might be net beneficial. So if we start to get below 10% body fat as a male, well, all of a sudden now that insulin sensitivity goes up. So having a high glycemic carb at certain periods of the day, post-workout, or maybe within that middle of the day type of day period, when the sun's at its highest and we hopefully can utilize that energy most efficiently, might be of net benefit. And then we start to time that out better. And we start to organize our training a little bit better. And we start to look at it from, I have an intention with what foods I'm eating when I'm eating it because it's part of a larger, more aggregate plan and that whole process. But just to backtrack from there, just start with addition by subtraction, the big four of hydration, high fiber, protein, and sleep. Then start to look at it from, okay, well, what's my plan? 
in these moments that I'm being most stressed? And what's my plan to help me get through a week, a two week period, a month period, right? Some people do better with shorter increments that have a amendment to their meal plan. Fine, we'll put that in on Thursday, that night that you know you're gonna be with the kids and you have no other options and you don't really wanna bring cut up vegetables and jerky with you to pick up your kids. You just wanna have a good meal with your kids and your wife and whatever else you do, like all good. But you gotta get back on on Friday. That's the tr that's the deal here because that's your goal, and we're making these like plans to handle life as it comes to you, but we also need to get you back on track quicker. And then as you get further along, like you're doing great, you're under ten percent body fat. Okay, now we can start to include high glycemic carbs post workout. It might come in supplemental form, or it might just come from having maybe some maple syrup with your shake, or having frosted flakes post workout with a whey protein shake. It can come a whole host of things. But it becomes more of a, that's a plan structured thing that we know is going to be a part of this overall higher level plan. So really if we're boiling it down, it's that big four, like hammer those, the, the big four, and then prepare. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually reading a book about astronauts. They, at NASA, they're training, like, what's the next thing that can kill me? It's like, what's the next thing that's going to throw me off track? Yeah. And then you have a plan for that. Like, okay, I, like you said, with the kids at swimming, okay, I need to bring jerky to swimming so that I don't get hungry. And then you have like a, that food emergency where you know you're going for, for the quick and easy thing. It's almost always carbohydrates, right? And so if I'm understanding correctly, it's not like you have to do keto. You got to go carnivore. It's not like this one diet to rule them all. It's more boils down to your consistency in these foundational habits. And then the more discipline you can get with it, the more freedom you have down the line. But that, again, it boils down to that psychological aspect and then the adherence and consistency with that individual. Yeah, well, I need to touch upon those like diets, right? We can go all the way back to the Mediterranean diet. We can go back to the zone diet, which is 30-30-30. Mm -hmm. We can look at... Um, ketogenic diet, a paleo diet, a carnivore diet, a vegan diet, all of them have rules. They have rules of like it, you know, the, the old adage, if it swims, if it runs, if it grows from the ground, it's safe to eat. You know, those are pretty good rules to kind of live by. And if it has a single ingredient, it's pretty fair game, right? Or if it has no ingredient list, that means it's assumed it's a beet or it's a chicken breast. Like that's kind of a good indicator of if it has no ingredient list, that means it's one ingredient. Those are rules, and that helps in terms of decision-making, right? Complexity is hard. Human bodies are complex, open, adaptive systems that procure energy from the outside world, and we have no idea how a molecule of energy is going to interact with our internal chemistry. So if I give you rules and consolidate down your decision to things that are going to decrease your overall caloric intake... Right, So if you look at a carnivore diet or ketogenic diet, you remove a lot of processed foods that's going to be high energy. There's a rule, and that rule creates less energy intake. right? And then it creates this other thing that's a phenomenon associated with it is usually a diet, like a carnivore diet, is a complete departure from what you normally eat. And there's a learning curve. And the association is, okay, well, you, since you don't know what to eat, you usually eat a couple things. And you stick to that out of fear of breaking this thing and not giving it just due. And maybe it's foods that are enjoyable, like eating more animal proteins with higher fat, eating more fruits or tropical fruits, which is always hysterical. Of like, yeah, this feels natural that we're eating papaya and, and, and plantains in Buffalo, New York in January. Like that's, yeah, that's normal. That's what we did. That's what our ancestors did. You know, that dynamic that I got from a gas station. I love the, I love the anecdote of, yeah, look at this. This is BS. Like, all right, man, it's just hysterical, the hypocrisy associated with it. Like, you're in a gas station talking about the best choices to make in Wisconsin, like, in the middle of January, and it has to be tropical, fruit-based, and, and animal protein. Like, But the other note of that, it's it confines people to decisions that makes it easy. And you're you're not faced with the overwhelming dilemma of, well, it depends, or that's a situationally dependent kind of conversation, and there's always going to be a shade of gray it creates absolutes and people love absolutes, man. They love black and white. They love this bad and good. And there'll be a net benefit for a period of time, right? You're restricting carbohydrates, whether it's a ketogenic or carnivore, or you're restricting processed foods or seed oils. Great. If you're going paleo, you're restricting probably breads and pastas that are going to be high in caloric density that are going to be typically overeaten. So that's good. If you look at it from a vegan standpoint, you're going to remove a lot of 
high fat foods, which is a high amount of calories. And a lot of times that the expectation that you're going to be net healthier is kind of misinformed, right? You are going to be short-term healthier because you're eating less. Hopefully it leads into better overall lifestyle and habits of sleeping more, exercising more, making better decisions with how you utilize and manage your stress. So that's, that's short-term positive. What we know long-term wise is that we are omnivorous animals, right? We have molars and we have incisors in our teeth. Just look at our mouth. We have molars to break down fibrous for foods. We have incisors to break down animal flesh. We look at our digestive system within our gut. We have pepsin and HCL to break down animal proteins. We have bile from the gallbladder to break down high fats. We have digestive enzymes and bacteria to break down all these starches and fiber within our gut. We are omnivorous by nature. That means whatever food is available to us, we find a way to prepare it and eat it. Sometimes it includes some sort of cooking process. Sometimes we can eat it raw in its natural form. But the bottom line is, as a species, we have functioned and really operated well from having a high ability to eat foods that are completely diverse and in range, right? We're not like a a herbivore or a carnivore-based animal. We're not. We're simply not. Because you can look at our teeth as a pretty good example. We look a lot different than a lion and a wolf from our actual dental structure and our digestive system. We look a lot different than a cow and other herbivores at, than we do from a digestive system pro process. And I think that's a pretty good tell of there's going to be a short lifespan for that. And it might be a jolt to your system and a way to refragment this built-in feedback loop of food and what you do. Great. Use it as a start point. But just like species, we have to evolve from that success point because your body will find a way to get to homeostasis. And typically, the pattern from there is once you realize how to eat less from that, your body will now figure out how to eat more, right? So you turn a eight ounce steak that's filling into a 12 ounce steak. You, you look at eating one plantain and you turn it into two or three. You look at, hey, I'm only going to eat foods that are devoid of wheat, soy, and dairy. Okay, well, you're going to find a lot of foods that are calorically dense and overeat that, right? Mark Sisson's got a really good line in, primal, in his Primal Blueprint book. Like, I like to make foods that people can overeat until they overeat it, all right? And then they overeat it every day. And I think that's the part that as we start to break it down, we're, we're always going to find some sort of default to try to eat more and, and try to get more in. You know, and if we could fight that human nature and that natural tendency by having a plan of, hey, this is going to be good until it's not. And if that's what's going to get you to eat less calories and eat more protein and sleep more and drink more water, great. But when that plan starts to fizzle out, here's our next step from there. We're going to include more fiber in your diet. We're going to get more starches and carbohydrates at certain times based off of what your body composition or what we're seeing from an energy, right? That if we deplete glycogen too long and running in ketones for too long, we start to see a downward effect, right? The body is... It's a hard diet, and I think the part that a lot of this originates from, and we look at ketogenic diet, and for the record, ketogenic diet is a fasting mimicking diet. So if you look at fasting, you should look at ketogenic the same way. And fasting is just removal of glucose to stimulate other processes to get lipolysis going and gluconeogenesis to procure energy from other bodily sources like adipose tissue. But if I look at the next step of, fast, of ketogenic diets, that is essentially fasting mimicking. And the reason why ketogenic diets exist is for people who had epilepsy and seizures. And what they found is glucose is a trigger to epilepsy and having seizures. So if we start to lower glucose, people with epilepsy have less seizures. And this has been shown. Now, the problem with that is there's a highly motivated group to not have seizures, right? Anyone who's ever been around someone with epilepsy, they will do whatever they have to do to not have a seizure. What they know this through the research is that it's a hard diet to adhere to, even with the extreme motivation of not having another seizure, right? So imagine that group, even looking at people with cancer who do better with less glucose in, that the proliferation of cancerous tissue is, is supported and amended by having higher glucose or higher energy yielding foods, that there's a lot of things that grow and proliferate and, and become more problematic with too much of anything, but even that, a highly motivated group doing a ketogenic diet has a hard time adhering to it. 
They resent the fact that they're sick and have to do this diet that's extremely restrictive. And they're willing to do that. It's like someone who has stage two cancer or lung cancer and it just doesn't want to give up cigarettes. They resent the fact that their body couldn't do this, right? There's a weird psychological impact from that. And to say that, hey, I want to lose weight and I'm going to adhere to a very strict ketogenic diet or a restrictive diet in general, what is the success rate in that? It's going to be extremely low. And that's where I think the problem with that logic is, is, yeah, it's a short-term benefit. There's a psychological window that you have an advantage for. You have a captive audience that's willing to do whatever they need to do, and they see a lot of short-term success. You lose weight fast. You're depleting your blood glycogen. You are restricting calories. You maybe be exercising more. All good. And then it doesn't work anymore. You see a plateau effect, and you see it's really restrictive. You see your weird one when you're out in social outings. You see that you struggle to adhere to this overall. Maybe you just want food that you enjoy, that you have a strong emotional connection to. And then it leads into, well, do I really need to be this intense about it? Do I really need to focus that much more on it? You know, you see the only really long-term success of people who have moral or some sort of religious connection to the foods they eat. That's the only thing that will hold them to it, right? So Christianity and periods of fasting or Lent, uh, you look at, you know, Hinduism and restricting in terms of animal proteins. Those are probably the only one, right? The Judaism and restricting swine, you know, that's the stuff that like, yeah, they'll have some weight because there's a lot of social pressure there and they built their entire pretty much system around it. But overall, if I'm trying to lose weight, I'm going to go to a restrictive diet in some capacity. It's a small window of success. And then after that, it might be an actually rebound effect that's more negative. So thinking about that as long term as well, like there's a dynamic, a place in the ketogenic diet that's good till it's not. What's your plan after that? That would be my point on that. All right, Tim, we've hit on a lot of great ideas. I thought this went uh, super deep, but it was fun. So yeah. thank you. Oh, yeah, man. All right, buddy. All right. See ya.